Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My very special guest is Michelle Raux. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for the time. Thanks so much uh, for coming on my show. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. How are you doing? Thanks. Uh, we met for the first time at the uh, um, Value Bitcoin Conference in Munich on June 3rd. In, yeah. And your presentation was just was just amazing. Uh, it was like hardcore data research analysis on on the what should I say the efficiency or the the, the question and topics around um, um, electricity consumption, right? Of of Among Bitcoin. Others, yeah. Well, it was lots of different things mingled together. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And then I think the la yeah the last time we met in Mid in Riga just briefly. Um, I wish we could have just, you know, also done a, a personal interview, but now we're good. Um, can you just uh, give give our my uh, listeners and viewers a short, um, you know, brief uh, introduction to your background? Because you have like, you know, pretty very research uh, emphasized um, background in, uh, at the crypto research and blockchain research program at the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, University of Cambridge, Judge Bus Business School, correct? It's a long name, but uh, it's exactly right. <laughs> okay, what, what's what's at the heart of your of your research, um, and and in the context of Bitcoin? So just to start, like we cover essentially the entire blockchain space. That so starts with Bitcoin, obviously, and then public blockchains and the crypto assets on top of them, but also enterprise blockchains and DLT shell ledgers, whatever you want to call them. So literally the entire space. Um, which means that we don't focus on a particular crypto asset per se because we're supposed to be impartial, right, independent, which doesn't mean that personally we, we can't have, you know, strong opinions. Um, that being said, uh, so really the research focuses mostly on the ecosystems, so understanding what types of actors exist, um, how they interact with each other, and essentially the impact that they have on the ecosystem itself. Um, and so for that, to that end, we essentially go to companies directly in the space, so in both the public as well as the enterprise blockchain space, um, and we reach out to them directly via surveys, personal interviews, combine that with publicly available data, so just gathering lots of different data points um, to then really provide an empirical picture or overview of, of how the ecosystem is essentially evolving. Okay, got it. Um... You have also uh, uh, created or are, are, you are leading a new company providing educational advisory services focused on digital assets and distributed consensus systems. Do you want to like uh, give a short overview of what, what, what's at the heart of this uh, company? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, essentially three months ago, I quit my full-time position as the, uh, the research lead for our cryptocurrency blockchain program. Um, to essentially start a company and the main reason behind that is that well first I've been doing research for like over five years now full-time on this very topic and so I just want to get more you know actively involved um, and second I just realized through ed executive education trainings uh, our you know conversation we have with regulators large institutions that essentially that knowledge gap um, is still enormously big um, and so there, there needs to be a lot of, um, you know, education efforts still done, uh, even now in 2019, to kind of close that gap or at least reduce it, because uh, frankly, I don't think we can ever close it. Um, and, and so, so that's why I decided to essentially launch an advisory firm, which focuses, well, first and foremost on education. So um, really understand, making people understand, or kind of like what would I like to call it is to make people unlearn the things they think they know. And actually start completely, you know, from scratch, tabula rasa. Um, because I think just there's so many misconceptions and uh, myth and yeah, misinformation out there that it's actually very difficult for someone who's not full-time in the space. And even those who are full-time in the space sometimes fall, you know, prey to that trap um, to, to actually really understand what's going on. So that's the first leg. And then the second, um, essentially, pillar stone, if you like, is really that once we're on the same page, um, I, I essentially advise companies or individuals on essentially how they can leverage some of these elements of the ecosystem and whether it does make sense to do so or not. So it's essentially a you know, no bullshit consulting approach um, <laughs> that essentially aims to save, especially companies, quite a lot of time, effort and resources by essentially right, right you know, from the start telling them that a full stack blockchain solution may probably not be the right um, you know, technology for them. 
Well, thank you for articulating it. There's so much, you know, bullshit going on and buzzwords and uh, and as you correctly, you know, stated also in your posts or, you know, explanations that you tweeted, tweeted out, it's, it's a lot of misconceptions also about the definition. Uh, it's like uh, one of these terms is, for example, um, uh, which which you, I don't know who created it, but it's like multi-party consensus versus blockchain networks. I mean, I want to talk about Bitcoin. This is the focus of our interview, but still, is there like one single use case or one single practical case where you could say an enterprise, a company or whatever has has applied, has used some kind of whatever DLT, distributed ledger technology, or, you know, a blockchain technology where you can literally see and evaluate the, the use case, the, the benefits, the values that's created out of this application. I mean, is there something besides Bitcoin? I mean, <laughs> well, there's, that's a good question, right? But, but I think it's worth separating it into essentially two different things. So first, Bitcoin is really something completely unique, I would say, even within that crypto asset ecosystem. Um, but I would like to separate that from these enterprise blockchain um, systems because, in my opinion, they try to solve a completely different problem. Mm -hmm. um, so what we found in our recent reports, and it's also a long-held belief that I had you know, for quite some time, is that, as you say, in pretty much, I would say, 99% of the cases, um, no blockchain, whether enterprise or you know, public blockchain, is actually needed um, to, to fulfill that business use case. Now, why do people still do it? Um, it's really because of that powerful idea, you know, blockchain, that abstract concept that gets people excited. And you get funding, um, and, and right? Actually, and you get immediate funding. Exactly. Right? I just want to say that. So get budgets <laughs> approved. Um, so everybody's happy in the end. You know, the C-level executives, they can say how innovative they are because they're pursuing a blockchain strategy. The engineers know that they will never, ever use a blockchain, but they're really happy that they finally got the budget and resources to do, you know, long overdue um, infrastructure upgrades uh, and we ran the IT stack, among others. But then it's also really between organizations, a way to essentially reorganize uh, long uh, existing business processes really between um, enterprise across, um, across companies. And that is mostly just a political issue or in some cases also regulatory issues. And now you have that powerful catalyst, blockchain, um, that seems to be a way to kind of like, you know, overcome these political differences and actually at least get people together on and to sit in a room on the table, like, uh, you know, um, to get on the table to essentially at least discuss <laughs> how, um, how they could improve things. And that's essentially what we call the blockchain meme because it's more about the idea behind that concept rather than actually the, te actually the technology or anything else, um, which is perfectly fine because I frankly think the impact will be really by an orders of magnitude larger um, mm -hmm. than probably any crypto asset, including Bitcoin, uh, will ever have. Um, because what industry could not benefit from you know, um, common data standards and um, easier integration between different systems? Now, whether it has anything to do with blockchain, apart from that meme <laughs> part, um, I frankly doubt it, but um, that's exactly it. And so I actually think it's a very positive development. The only problem is that because all of these uh, networks are now, now being deployed, although they have very little in common with, with, with uh, what, what I would consider a blockchain, they are still being labeled and advertised as blockchain networks with all these characteristics that you know, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin also have. And that, again, uh, adds essentially to that knowledge gap, makes it actually even larger because now people see like, oh, JP Morgan is using a blockchain. So, you know, X, Y, Z. And there's literally nothing related between the two. <laughs> so, again, it, it's a good development, but the problem is the terminology hasn't really caught up with them. And so hopefully by introducing that term blockchain meme, it kind of like makes people rethink the way that they use the term and hopefully switch. Maybe I haven't given up hope yet. <laughs> switch to some other term uh, to actually refer to these systems. Got it, got it. Fascinating. So um, now you've done studies. Um, I just want to briefly uh, still touch upon the, this topic of, of uh, uh, this, this, this whole, you know, hyster hysteria, I don't know what to call it else, about the elect uh, electricity consumption of Bitcoin and, you know, the whole environmental uh, issues or I don't know how to, what to call it, propaganda <laughs> that's evolving around it. Um, now, I know this is not a finite conclusion because, right, the, the retrieval of, of 
correct or precise data is pretty difficult, right? I mean, can, could you say how much percentage at this, at, at this phase is used um, uh, let's say, you know, uh, renewable energy, for example, is that still around 78, 80%? Um, well, frankly, I was actually never really sure about that figure, um, which I think is from the conscious report, right? Um, mm -hmm. So to me, it sounded very, very high. Um, so we had a much more conservative uh, estimate by actually talking to some miners, which again is also incomplete because you, you, you're not catching everyone. Um, but that was more around, I think, 25, uh, 30%. So it's probably somewhere in between there, but the problem is it's not something that is, um, you know, a fixed proportion. Um, because as we see now with the Chinese um, wet season and so on, it, it is like kind of a cycle to it. So sometimes um, it's just more cost efficient to actually use renewables, whereas in other cases, um, essentially there there is no way of doing that because it's not enough load. And so essentially what you need to do um, is essentially to just use, you know, coal-fired power stations or even generators as long as it's still, um, you know, profitable to do so. So it's essentially really just a business decision. Um, and, and as such, unless you really are um, analyzing and tracking the energy consumption, including the mix of every single mine on the planet, there are at least, the, let's say, the 90 to 95 percent or those who are responsible for 90 to 95 percent of the hash rate, Unless you do that, it's, it's really just educated guessing. And frankly, we'll never get to a point where we get all that data, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, all you can do is educated guessing. Because that wouldn't be also the point, right? Because of the anonymity, right? <laughs> exactly, it would present definitely some, some issues. So of course, as a researcher, it would be great to have like a map with all you know, different mm -hmm. uh, hashing facilities with all the data there. But then the problem is with that, exactly as you mentioned, uh, miners give up their anonymity which already to some extent is not like as large as people might think, but at least there needs to be the option for miners to actually, you know, go under the radar in, in case of something, you know, more, um, let's say political bad wind or something like that happening. Um, and as such, while as a researcher, I would love to have that map. Um, as an, let's say, Bitcoin sympathizer, I don't think it's actually good any to have something like that. So um, yeah, it's always like a double-edged sword. It's, it's never black and white. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Um, so, Michelle, um, you posted some time ago uh, on Twitter. Let me let me pull this up. Maybe I can find this. I had it right there. Oh, there we go. Um, let me uh, share a screen with you. This this because I found it pretty interesting. Your comments. Uh, you were at a central bankers meeting, academics today in Luxembourg. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, when was that? Uh, was that a while ago or? Uh, uh, you have to look at the tweets then because I frankly can't remember. Oh yeah, uh, September seventeenth, two thousand nineteen. Yeah. yeah, so pretty much a month ago, three to four weeks. Yeah, and I found your your comments pretty fun. Um, it said um, um, something like, "You, I don't, I can't find it at this moment." But you said like. Um, uh, you know, it took a while till they till they even mentioned uh, Bitcoin or talked about. Uh, what, could you do? You want to recapitulate? Like, what was the atmosphere like? Like, did uh, what? What's the direction there? That, that you know, uh, these central banks or whoever these uh, people were at this uh, um, you know congregation. Uh, what, what was the, what was the like the topic of this uh, or the intention of this of this meetup of this conference? Uh, um, so, um, as the title already says, it was really about discussing the future of the international monetary system, um, which is not really something that you change every you know year or another. Um, so we're really talking about like long cycles of twenty to you know up to fifty hundred years um, of an established order. And so it was organized by the BCL, so the, the Central Bank of Luxembourg, uh, together with Toulouse um, School of Economics, which have one of the Nobel laureates. Or shall I rather say the what is it the memorial prize or something like that in memory of Alfred Nobel mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in economics? So uh, Jean Tirole was there as well, and so it was really a discussion about how a new monetary uh, system or international monetary order uh, could look like, and what assets it would be based on, whether it would be um, you know uh, um, some sort of hegemony, so still dollar hegemony, or some other asset, maybe the renminbi 
or whether it's really a more multilateral order. Um, so where you have essentially different countries, different nations that um, essentially have some sort of shared basket, similar to like special drawing rights uh, from the IMF. Um, and of course, cryptocurrencies at some point also pop up in the discussion, um, like how could they fit into that new order? Um, now, most were actually pretty skeptical, but there were a few people actually that had rather, let's say, um, I was surprised actually by the understanding, especially from the European Central Bank. Um, and that kind of like mirrors many of the discussions that I had also when I was still at Cambridge uh, full time uh, with some of the regulators that we had. So um, especially central bankers are a lot better informed than most people in Bitcoiners would actually think. Um, that doesn't mean that they will necessarily, you know, completely change their mind in terms of whether Bitcoin is going to be um, the next, you know, um, money and as part of that international monetary order. Um, but the thing is, they, they can have very, you know, um, let's say deep discussions and, and essentially voice their concerns over that. Um, and that's an, a really interesting development. So um, that was a pretty positive note. Although, of course, in the end, um, let's say Bitcoin cryptocurrencies were completely ruled out as uh, playing some role in that uh, monetary order. Because... Uh, well, okay, Bitcoin is the, the essence of purpose of Bitcoin is the separation of uh, state, government, and money. And um, when you, I don't well, know, not, not only, uh -huh. so yeah. This, yeah, so sorry to interrupt you, but it's something that Bitcoiners talk a lot about, like oh, the separation between state and, and money. But there's always like the thing about non sovereign money, right? So separating that power from the state. Now, the thing is, now we've got something like Libra. And everybody's crying out like, oh, no, you can't have a company or, you know, a consortium of companies um, creating a new international, you know, money. Now, the thing is, that is also by definition not sovereign, right? It's also separated from the state, but it's not necessarily something that's desirable, at least for many Bitcoiners. Um, so I would actually say we need to separate our money from any sort of authority would probably be, you know, more generic, but also more broadly applicable. Um, because that would also apply then to large companies, multinationals, or these um, consortiums of um, you know these companies, or any type of organization, essentially. Okay, and a non-monopoly money. I mean, is, isn't that what Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin to you, uh, Michelle? I mean, what is uh, when you first uh, like came upon Bitcoin, like uh, you learned about Bitcoin? What what, what was because you you um, I think some somehow your statement on the Value of Bitcoin conference was like. Um, uh, it, it's not uh, hyphenated, but it's like Bitcoin is one of you. I guess it's one of it's your statement. Let me let me screen share this with you. Um, you said here, Bitcoin is one of the most fascinating socioeconomic experience human history, originally emerging and developing in global scale, bypassing a long-standing comp problem in computer science: the prevention of double spends without relying on a central authority. With an economic and game theory-based solution, is nothing short of a stroke of a genius. That doesn't mean that Bitcoin is without flaws, however. Do you want to comment on that? Because I want to know your vision. I mean, your, what, what, yeah. what's, what's Bitcoin for you, uh, for society, for you know, monetary uh, economical system? Well, it's many different questions in, in packed in, in one. <laughs> so maybe I'll that, 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 yeah. <laughs> package them a bit. So, so in terms of that statement, what I particularly find interesting and fascinating about Bitcoin is really that organic development. And the fact that it is inherently global by nature um, and based really on a combination of so many different disciplines um, and so many different fields that in order to understand it, you really need to have a very, you know, um, holistic um, picture of all what's going on, which means that I'm, I'm for example, an, uh, an economist by training and also did some uh, business um, studies which is interesting to understand the economic side of Bitcoin, but had absolutely no idea about the technical side, whether it's about cryptography, about distributed systems. Back then, I didn't even really know how the internet worked on my computer, and frankly, I couldn't care less. And suddenly with Bitcoin, all of that had to change because in order to at least you know, get a glimpse of how it works, I needed to go into all these, these separate uh, disciplines. Um, and that includes you know, politics as well, that includes sociology, and all of these, you know, very wide range of different disciplines. And that is really from an intellectual point of view, what, what I find enormously fascinating. And I can't really see that in many other projects that are going on um, because it's mostly more, you know, myopically focused on one particular thing, which is good as well. Um, but this is really requires you to, to open up yourself also to other, you know, areas, things 
that frankly before you either were afraid actually of looking at or actually just had no whatsoever interest in it. Um, and so you have to kind of like, you know, go through that. And, and it's just like every day in your learning experience. So people think now that because I'm in space and, and you know, give talks and lectures and all that stuff that I know everything. But I would never ever consider myself to be really an expert because it's just, there's something about Bitcoin, about cryptocurrencies every day um, that I discover or learn about. So um, it's like a continuous you know, learning journey. And that is really what, what is so fascinating about it. So that's the first part from an intellectual point of view. It's, it's enormously challenging, but also very rewarding. Um, but then in terms of like what the project can actually do, so it's not like only some sort of theoretical concepts, um, you know, typically academic, <laughs> Way just like theorize about that but no it's actually implemented in practice and it's been working for 10 years now uh, and people use it in so many different ways um, that probably Satoshi couldn't even imagine uh, back then when he conceived it and just seeing that um, is super fascinating as well so there's some practical use to it as well and so those two things together so the theory as well as the practical aspects merge together really make it such an interesting experiment and then the fact that it's global so anyone can participate in it it's permission as access. Um, there's so much material and resources out there. Um, so really anyone can, can just like, you know, join, doesn't need to have a university degree to do that. And, and that's really an, an, an enormously, you know, um, fascinating social experiment. And I call it socioeconomic because it's like, again, merging that social dimension of cryptocurrencies. Um, so the social contract, although again, there's technically no contract, but still I like to call it that way. Um, and of course, some more technical properties, but all in the end is really based on a clever economic incentive design. So it all boils down again to the socioeconomics. Um, so pretty much that I think sums up um, why I'm personally really interested in Bitcoin. And, and frankly, not only Bitcoin. Um, so I don't really discriminate between all these other forms. Like I'm not a hardcore Bitcoin maximalist or whatever you want to call it. Um, the thing is, um, I want to be pragmatic and independent in a sense that I just want to look at different systems and see whether they do make sense for me, whether there's some utility to them, uh, whether the trade-offs that they choose do make sense as well. Um, and if there's something better than Bitcoin that comes along, I'll be very happy to not necessarily switch to that, but at least also just like, you know, consider it open. Now, the only thing is, and it's kind of like what well, my talk was all about uh, at, at Munich, is that really right now um, in terms of really having some actually utility beyond just you know token uh, offerings and and some other like very niche applications there's literally nothing apart from bitcoin right now that really gets me excited now that being said like ethereum does some interesting things i consider ethereum to be a big experiment as well but i think there's some lack of focus because there's no clear clearly defined value proposition um and ethereum kind of tries to be everything at the same time and that really leads to some sort of, you know, lack of focus, lack of vision, in my opinion, um, which then has implications on essentially the way that the system is run and operated. Um, and as such, really, I think long-term, it's gonna be really difficult for Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with Bitcoin, sure, we've had, you know, an evolution of all these different uh, value propositions. Um, you know, I, I remember that in early 2014, when I first came into the space, it was all about it's enabling cheap, fast payments, cross-border, uh, everybody will pay in Bitcoin. Now I think that narrative has gone as well. So Bitcoin also had, you know, some time to, to essentially try to find its, its core value proposition. But now I think after 10 years, um, it's really come to the community that this is really about creating a new type of money or some sort of artificially scarce digital commodity. Um, with an integrated value transfer system that is censorship resistant. And that is a very clearly defined value proposition where then from taking that, essentially you can you know, go down and actually see, do the technical trade-offs that we engage in, as well as the social and economic trade-offs, actually move us closer towards that goal or further away from that. And I think that is exactly what right now is lacking in Ethereum because they do not have really that benchmark to compare with. So do we want to be an open permissionless application platform where anyone could just like deploy an application with you know, two, three lines of solidity code? Great. Um, but for that, we don't need to have a certain level of uh, censorship resistance. Or do we actually want to build unstoppable applications, but then we need to engage in like serious trade-offs that will limit throughput um, and performance. 
And, and so unless you really have that one clear vision, it's going to be really difficult to kind of like align the technical roadmap with essentially what users wish to use the system for and what this system in the end stands for. And I think in Bitcoin, it's very clearly defined. Um, and also over the years with this entire block size debate, SegWit and here and there, we've had so many different episodes uh, where essentially that idea kind of like got, um, I would say, validated again and again and again. Um, and I think really that's where Bitcoin is heading for and, and, and I think that gives it a very clear direction. And that being said, again, there's many things I could think of that could go wrong. <laughs> so it's also not a guaranteed uh, trajectory or path. Um, but yeah, at least it's what sets it, uh, in my opinion, completely apart from pretty much any other crypto asset or currency. Great, great. Um, so um, I, I heard you. I heard you talk on the. Uh, I, I uh, listened again to the interview with Peter McCormack. That you mm -hmm. did it was a great interview where you briefly um, mentioned the the data, uh, the estimates that. Uh, you would have for for the global usage of Bitcoin, or you know the number the, that that's always you know a question for me. What is like the minimum? What's like the triggering or tipping point for mass adoption? This is but but okay. Is there a, like a realistic, serious estimate of how many people are hodling or you know using it? Like the estimates vary considerably, and mostly they're not just focused on Bitcoin, but generally crypto assets, you know, overall or more broadly. Um, which still means that probably pretty much anyone in, uh, invested or the vast majority of people invested somehow in crypto assets also hold a fraction of Bitcoin. So I would say the overlap is pretty large. Um, so what we did is we reached out to service providers, so custodial wallets, exchanges, and so on, um, and, and actually got user numbers from them. Um, and also um, essentially statistics on uniquely ID verified users. Now that doesn't mean that they can't switch, you know, or have like different um, service providers at the same time. But then also we didn't really capture much of the Asian service providers because of language barriers and they were a bit more willing to participate. Um, and so I think those two effects more or less cancel each other out. So what we got is, and that was again in December last year, so it's almost been a year now, um, that was around 35 million unique uh, crypto asset users, which means also pretty much the equivalent of Bitcoin users. Um, so there are various estimates. Some are as low as like 10 million, others go to over 100 million. But even if you take that number, like let's say 35 to 40 million, that's already quite a lot actually. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you actually you know, compare it to the total world population. Um, so yeah, it's like almost 1%, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I think one, one of the key questions is really to, to actually determine like what do we mean by crypto asset user or Bitcoin user, right? Is it somebody who's just like hodling? Is it somebody who holds a few satoshis completely forgotten about them? Uh, is it somebody who's using it daily, weekly, you know, monthly? Um, what for? To do payments, to, um, to essentially, you know, just do timestamping. So essentially insert, um, you know, files or essentially hashes into the Bitcoin blockchain to use as a public notary. There is no clear definition of that. And that's also why it's always been very difficult for us to come up with like reliable statistics on active users um, because nobody really knows how to define active. <laughs> so, yeah. so you need first to define what you mean by user and then second, what you mean by active mm -hmm. users. So. Mm -hmm. Since uh, there are countries, you know, like in Venezuela, Argentina, Turkey, Iran, where there's, you know, you don't need much explaining to, you know, to people who experience uh, inflation, hyperinflation, uh, or you know, um, uh, capital control. Um, is there is there like a distribution? I mean, is it is it is it possible to 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 say that there's you know specific countries where there's dominantly uh, you know number of users or something like that? Uh, it's always difficult to, to actually determine because most of these service providers are essentially you know operating globally and so they don't really make a difference between where users come from and also frankly today it's so easy to obfuscate uh, your location with mm -hmm. VPNs and all that stuff um, that uh, I frankly think most of these user statistics unless they're again ID verified um, it's pretty difficult to actually uh, make make a statement like that. So of course you can look at like P2P exchanges or local Bitcoin volumes and so on, which gives you some sort of indication. But if you then put that into perspective with like global trading volumes, um, it's like really marginal. So, so I like that approach. I can't remember who actually did that, who was comparing, um, well, actually actively monitoring local Bitcoin volumes, just use it as a proxy for interest in especially those countries that are hit by 
you know, some political, um, you know, interventions or seizures or inflation um, getting out of control. And so there's a clear correlation there to these kind of events and then people turning to these P2P exchanges. Um, but again, saying that or, or, or taking that as a starting point for saying then that those countries are like, you know, main Bitcoin users, I think it's a bit far-fetched mm -hmm. uh, because probably it's still like most users are still based in North America, Western, Eastern Europe, um, and some parts in Asia. Now, signing out like specific countries is frankly pretty difficult. So, Do you find it, would you, uh, do you, do you think it's realistic that in the next 10 years we'll have like an exponential curva, uh, curvature like in, in the number of users worldwide? Like from 30, um, 40 million to, I don't know, to, I don't know what the tipping number could be, but like at least 100, 200 million people? It's possible, but I would say then as a result, it would rather be indirectly. Maybe, for example, if you have pension funds mm -hmm. uh, that would start holding Bitcoin, which means that indirectly, um, you know, millions of, um, of people um, would essentially be indirect um, shareholders. Well, not shareholders, but essentially holders of Bitcoin, at least on their behalf. Um, but like directly, I frankly don't think it is going to be like an exponential growth. Uh, I think it's going to be more linear uh, if... Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Even long term, like uh, next 10, 20 years, is that's what you see? Or yeah, because that's, that's... It, it really depends on, on, on uh, I would say, like macroeconomic conditions and really the way that the financial system is going to develop. Um, so, frankly, like 10 years ago, I would already have thought that at some point, you know, everything is going to crash again and a lot worse than it did in 2007, 8. Um, but now, frankly, with, with that environment that we're in, um, pretty much globally, I, I think it could technically go on for like, like 10, 20 more years. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. So, it's, frankly, we, we just don't know because this is also a big social experiment. Right? There's never been a period in human history, at yeah. least uh, a period that we know of, um, where we had this experiment of central banks actually, um, you know, going into negative uh, interest rates territory. And, um, yeah, this completely just changes everything um it changes everything for businesses everything for consumers especially savers and so it's going to be really difficult to to foresee what will emerge out of that so you can make a bull case for bitcoin but you could also make a bad case for bitcoin depending on you know what arguments you choose so it's going to be really difficult to actually uh, make like some sort of prediction um and as a result of that, like again, going back to like that social nature of Bitcoin or socioeconomic nature, it's really something that takes you, even if you're completely hooked by it and fascinated by it, it takes you years to actually start to actually to comprehend it. Now for like the average Joe in the street, whether it's in a developing country or developed country, there's frankly like in terms of payment infrastructure, in terms of the money that they have access to, right now they do or mostly do not have any problems at all, right? So they have like four different cards from four different providers. They work on four different networks. Um, so they have all these protocols essentially in their wallet, right? So like, uh, let's say Visa cards and uh, debit cards, um, I don't know, PayPal accounts. And frankly, the, the, the variety and, and the, just the range of options available to them is so broad that frankly, they don't really see at all what it would use, a sort of expensive censorship resistant value transfer system up until the point where they actually need to, <laughs> and then it's probably too late. Um, and, and that is but these are the people in Western privilege, like, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. Austria, you know, wherever in Europe, like the Western developed nations, this is, uh, this is the, you know, the, the typical reaction of people. It's like, you know, what do I need Bitcoin for? You know, I mean, I've, I've got all the privilege. I've got a bank account. I, I can pay my coffee with my whatever ATM or, uh, you know, credit card cash. So that's, but I'm talking like people, like 2 billion people having no access, you know, to identification or or to bank accounts do you do you see that i mean um you know it, especially because of the geopolitical and macroeconomical conditions evolving you know with the recession maybe coming next year and you know negative interest yeah rate policy. it's a fair point i think it's a fair point to distinguish between developing countries and developed countries but then the problem is like let's imagine everybody would actually say in developing countries or let's say a share of the population would actually move to bitcoin uh fully move there now, the thing is, in order to actually benefit from all the advantages that Bitcoin provides, like having unseizable, very difficult to seize assets, access to that censorship resistant network, they need to be on chain. Now, as we've seen in 2017, 
once and, and that's kind of like an, an, an interesting um, observation for public blockchains in general so it applies to ethereum as well so as soon as a public blockchain gets popular it actually becomes unusable or very difficult to use mm. and that's simply because the performance is not high the throughput isn't high so as a result you have that uh, adjustment mechanism with transaction fees that have to counter that in order to essentially use that um, that fixed block size um, now again raising the block size won't we really or changing block size won't really help with that, at least not in the long term. But so the thing is, you can't really scale indefinitely on chain now. But in order to actually benefit from that, you need to be on chain or at least use something like Lightning, which again then also has some other habits, um, but it's probably, um, you know, for another discussion. That would be, but that would and be so, interesting. I, I want to know what your, your opinion on the Lightning, on the evolve, evolve, evolution of the Lightning network and the, uh, the scaling of the payments. Uh, yeah, so, so maybe we can talk about that a bit later. Okay. Um, I just want to finish this thought of line. Um, so the, the, the thing is, what, 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 would mean, what, what this would lead to essentially is that most of these people would flock to custodial service providers, which then technically doesn't really change anything for them, except that they have now access to different assets, which in many cases might already be sufficient. But even that, like you have so many remittance companies that opened in 2012, 13, especially in the Philippines and Southeast and Asia and so on, but also in Africa. And pretty much all of them closed down, or like the, the vast majority closed down, just simply because network fees and on Bitcoin are so unpredictable. Um, and also just because the more people use it, the more expensive and slow it gets. It's just like a thing that's inherent to public blockchains, unless they you know, engage in different trade-offs, which would then have an impact on decentralization and eventually censorship resistance. And so the problem is with all of these different scenarios, it's sure you could have millions of people using it indirectly via custodial service providers, but then technically they wouldn't really be using Bitcoin. They would be using a second a trusted layer, if you like, and that wouldn't give them really any of the benefits um, that actually on-chain Bitcoin gives them, apart really from having access to an, a completely you know, different asset type. Mm -hmm which might be fine again for most of the people, but so going back to the remittance companies example is that even using Bitcoin in the background, so at the back end, to essentially move money globally around and then pay it out and see it again in the local currency, even at some point that wasn't profitable or economic anymore. And the thing is, the more popular Bitcoin gets, the more people will want to use on-chain transactions, the more fees are gonna rise, which then at some point will automatically, like literally, it's kind of like, you know, by nature will, price out all of these use cases um, where essentially Bitcoin right now may be the only option or the, the, the best alternative that's out there. And so that, that's a that kind of like, you know, contradictory or yeah, the kind of a contradiction there is like, we want to have more users, but if we're going to have more users, automatically all these use cases where Bitcoin is the best or only option are eventually going to be priced out because of the way that the Bitcoin trade-offs work and pretty much any public blockchains. Um, so I don't really know how to how to solve that. Sure, you've got like secondary layers. Um, again, you could use custodial service providers, which in my opinion is also an, an, a secondary layer scaling solution because without that, we would never have gotten to the, uh, to the user numbers we have today, to be frank. Um, so yeah, it's probably gonna, gonna have to involve really a variety of different um, options and systems and layers that all work together. And again, where users can choose um, which ones they want to use according to their own preference, convenience, and, and also the price they're willing to pay, frankly. But for all these reasons, I, uh, I'm a bit skeptical that we're going to see like just some exponential increase, apart from the fact when we, really, um, let's say, we're going to have like a really huge currency crisis. Um, and essentially, people would really notice that pretty much all their savings are gone in just like an instant. Mm -hmm. um, and if that would happen, then I could see a scenario where Bitcoin as an alternative asset uh, could become very popular. And for that, you don't really need to have on-chain transactions, right? You just want to have some coins, um, which don't necessarily even need to be taken in, in self-custody uh, if you just consider it to be an, an, an investment. Um, and in that way, uh, I could actually see that like in a very short amount of time, um, the user numbers would, would grow considerably. But is that going to happen? I frankly don't know. Mm. But yeah, you said something very important, which uh, I think is very important to emphasize that there is still, uh, let's say, a pretty you know big uh, segment of the population who are going to uh, just uh, uh, you know have custodial wallets, 
All right. Uh, whether it's the older generation or people who are maybe not so tech savvy or maybe just insecure, you know. Uh, but that would be interesting. How much, you know, how many people are, what, what's the percentage of the population with, whether it's in Europe or wherever, you know, uh, uh, not take, you know, self-sovereign control over their, uh, yeah, their whatever. I, know, I think the majority right of, uh, of users. Mm -hmm. It's definitely the majority of users. But then again, it comes back to the definition, what is a user? So especially in 2017 and early 18, and we had so many, you know, inexperienced I wouldn't even call them investors. It was like literally, you know, the average Joes, um, you know, people from family or whatever friends that were just like driven by FOMO, which was actually stirred up by all the media that they couldn't stop talking about the new records of ICOs and Bitcoin price and blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, so got all very excited. But most of them, they essentially just, you know, bought some shit coin or a little bit of Bitcoin for like, you know, a few hundred dollars worth of it maximum. Um, then saw the entire price and market crash. Um, and that's essentially it, right? So they kind of like just leave it at the custodial service provider and they probably will forget it up until the next bull run again. Um, and then desperately try to access that account <laughs> and getting through like two, three weeks of KYC and all that stuff <laughs> and verification. But um, so, so I would say in terms of like, just if, if you just look at the users themselves, I think the vast majority of users are on custodial services. Um, but the interesting question is like the vast majority of Bitcoins held by, let's say, big whales, um, where does that money sit? Mm. And I think in that case, there's a lot more sophisticated arrangements. Uh, so there's some sort of like hybrid custody model where um, probably the user can unilaterally move it, but has some backup keys somewhere. Well, uh, multi different locations, right? probably. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Or just some hybrid arrangement where neither the user nor the service provider can unilaterally spend it. So they always need to cooperate. And there's like maybe two, three parties um, that are available as an option. So that would actually be more interesting. And I, I would say that the majority of these whales and, and like large holders that they um, tend more towards self custody because they actually get the importance of that. Mm -hmm. um, but frankly, for like the most people, especially in Western countries, I think it's actually a lot safer for them to use custodial service providers. Not anyone, but like, you know, companies like Coinbase, like Circle and so on, who actually have, frankly, done a good job mm -hmm. um, in actually securing their users' coins. Probably a lot better than most users would have done themselves. So it's yeah. again a trade off. Exactly. Um, so there, there is one post you did uh, recent. Uh, when was that? Oh, on Twitter thread. Um, start with trade invoicing oh something about time stamping you you mentioned that word uh in the beginning of our interview uh um something about time stamping public notary are there more institutions like asking or or at least you know looking into this op you know po opportunity possibility to time stamp um what did you call it like like validating um uh, data on the public um uh, uh, uh you know on, on on the bitcoin protocol on the bitcoin blockchain do you want to comment on that? Um, I don't think it's very common yet. Um, so there are a few companies that actually provide, you know, very easy integrations for companies to actually just like timestamp literally any email they get, any document, any file they have. And so in the background, they batch that all together and then in like periodic uh, intervals, they actually um, um, essentially use the Mac root of that and then um, add the hash to, to uh, um, become blockchain. Whether they actually have a lot of customers, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I think it's growing, but I think really the, the potential hasn't really been actually fully appreciated yet, especially by companies themselves. Um, and that's something really I've been fascinated. Like it's the most interesting non-monetary use case that's out there, frankly, um, because really benefiting from such a globally accessible public notary that has essentially economic guarantees, well, not guarantees, but let's say, economic um, considerations as to how difficult it is to change that registry um, and actually being able to do that at a very low cost. So we're talking about uh, Bitcoin transactions before and transactions can get pretty expensive pretty soon. But with timestamping, frankly, you can just like batch billions of different files and documents and things together and you just pay like the minimum transaction fee because you don't really care whether it's in the, the next block or in the next 10 blocks as long as it's like on that day or whatever your, your time preference is. Um, and, and so it's actually a very low cost, um, you know, use case, which potentially could really have very huge, uh, large consequences uh, and impact. Um, 
Yeah. But and, and in fact, also something that I find interesting is that like looking at most enterprise blockchain use cases, it's also just about time stepping. So as, as soon as there's no natively digital asset involved, there could be like an, you know, a, a digitized security that actually just exists within the system itself. Um, so if, if we're really talking about only tokenized assets, which still require a bridge to the real world or the world where they exist, the system that they exist in, or frankly, it's just like information. So we're just talking about record keeping systems that are shared and maintained by different parties. Like in most cases, what you need actually is just a time stepping service. And that's it, where you can essentially verify, not necessarily the data, but verify the existence and the integrity of that data um, without having to essentially trust someone to um, operate that registry. And so like 90% of these enterprise blockchain use cases that are about this can actually be implemented a lot quicker and a lot cheaper by just using the Bitcoin blockchain, in my opinion, um, in periodic intervals by anchoring system state or different documents into the Bitcoin blockchain rather than trying to come up with a complex uh, full stack blockchain system that is very inefficient to run and is actually a lot less secure than the Bitcoin blockchain because in the end it all boils down again to corporate governance. Um, so who can actually change their registry? Mm -hmm. And in public, uh, so in private blockchains, all it takes is a signature. <laughs> which is essentially, you know, cost zero to produce. Uh, and so you, again, rely on the legal system and the threat, essentially, of legal actions um, to essentially defend yourself against that. And then you can just use some sort of third-party service provider where you have contractual agreements with them, and that's all good. So why would you want to actually spin up a complicated system, super inefficient to run, and actually provides you less security and guarantees than just by using, essentially, a public notary such as Bitcoin? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, the classic example would be land registry. I mean, uh, the the whole system would have to transform and adapt to this kind. I mean, this this is not reality, right? For the next uh, couple decades to come, right? <laughs> uh, land registry or you know, property. No, and you can't just have a land registry on Bitcoin uh, because again, this is like one of the the most common misunderstandings uh, about blockchains. Is exactly. that, in my opinion, they only make sense if you have a native internal resource or an, an internal resource that's native to the system itself um so that could be an asset or it could be some sort of like well gas in the case of ethereum for example so some sort of commodity that makes the system run um but as soon as there's an, an a use case that requires to have some connection to an external system then the blockchain really just becomes a record keeping system that's it you can't really enforce anything about um, the decisions that it takes because it has absolutely no reach over that other external system. Um, but also it can't really understand what's going on outside. Um, and so it's completely dependent on oracles. And so you again have those gateways that needs to bridge the gap. And then frankly, like I don't really see what the blockchain can really provide uh, apart from again, being some sort of no tree or time stamping service. Um, but so yeah, you can't really have a land registry on the blockchain unless really the entire system um, just operates completely on that and is actually also supported mm -hmm. by the legal authorities uh, in that country or whatever you where, wherever you're going to implement it. So what you could do is you could have the traditional land registry the way it exists today and actually uh, periodically anchor um, some of those files and 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 essentially register or records that they have into the public Bitcoin blockchain as an additional verification so mm -hmm. that you can provide your um, users with that information as well so that they can check for themselves uh, that whether the, what they see in the um, um you know in the registry itself whether that actually complies with uh, as an additional with, uh, transparency uh, feature sort of exactly yeah. yeah yeah now of course you still have to trust that the system um you know, the, the registry shows you the correct details, but that's like literally something, you know, if your name is wrong or something like that, well, right. you know that something is wrong. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, went wrong. All right. All right, Michel. So uh, final thoughts. I mean, uh, wh wh where do you see the, the biggest, um, let's say the, the obstacle challenges or, you know, maybe f interesting developments right now going on with Bitcoin? Um, what is your vision? I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear any prediction, but do you have like a, do you see like uh, anything emerging that is, that is going to fundamentally, you know, transform or change the, the, you know, the roots of our structural systems right now with Bitcoin? I don't really think so. Um, at least not in the medium term. 
Um, I think the system has really got to a point where also in terms of like social consensus, I think it's pretty clear now, again, going back to like the vision discussion that we had in the beginning, uh, and also the recent episodes have just shown us how difficult it actually is to change Bitcoin. Um, so in that regard, uh, except if there's like some sort of emergency bug or some sort of, you know, external intervention by let's say nation says something like that, I don't really think that anything in terms of consensus was will really change. Um, now in terms of like, yeah, technical uh, improvements, so it's going to be interesting to see Schnorr, uh, Mast and all these other uh, techniques that are being developed right now. Um, because they're going to have an, an impact definitely on the way that the protocol is being used. Um, but are they going to fundamentally change Bitcoin itself? I frankly don't really think so. It's going to be just an, another um, important optimization. And um, and that's great. So I think really Bitcoin is is going to kind of like move steadily in the direction it has been going for the last 10 years. Frankly. So just like straight up. Uh, when I say straight up, I don't necessarily mean price wave. Don't get me wrong. I just mean like a steady traje uh, trajectory in terms of like developments um, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. But in terms of challenges, um, what's interesting is that, sure, you can still have nation states that could, you know, clamp down on Bitcoin and essentially um, completely, well, make it illegal to own Bitcoin, which would be an, a very, very, um, you know, challenging environment for Bitcoin to, it would probably survive, but um, it would definitely, I would say, become less secure just because it, it's going to have less value as a result, less hash power and so on. Um, but I don't really foresee that as something that's very likely to happen um, for the very simple reason that now the Bitcoin user base or holder base is so diverse and broad and includes many people that work in public administrations as well. That includes many powerful uh, people in various positions, not only in the government, but also like big uh, you know, corporate uh, structures. And they all have a personal incentive on essentially keeping the value of their investment high as well. Um, so I think Bitcoin's lobby uh, in the sense that, you know, people driven by their personal interests in it, uh, is just constantly growing. And as a result for any state, especially Western states, it will probably be very, very difficult to actually ban it or make it illegal without like really facing social uh, unrest as a result of that. And the more people that are going to hold Bitcoin, the bigger that, um, let's say, indirect lobby is actually going to become, which means also the more difficult it's going to be to actually uh, enforce these measures. So in that regard, I don't really think that's an issue either, but I think really the biggest challenge long term um, is going to be um, essentially the block rewards. Um, so subsidy going down to zero, or almost zero. And the question whether transaction fees can really support um, the security level that we have at least right now. Um, I think that's a really big question. And all those theories about, oh yeah, the fee market's going to do that. Well, that's all great. But the question is really, is it going to be enough or sufficient to compensate for that loss in, in the block subsidy? And I'm personally a bit skeptical. So I think in, the, in 10 years, we're probably going to have a very interesting um, discussion, if you can call it that way, <laughs> uh, that's going to be a lot worse than the block size debate or the block size war uh, about whether you know, we're going to need to, to, um, to change the consensus rules to either, you know, um, change the 21 million coin limit or recover some of the supposedly stolen oh lost coins. That's going to trigger that a lot of people, I think Michelle. <laughs> that's going to trigger a lot. I know, I know. <laughs> and I, I'm not saying that I approve of this, but I, I definitely, so, so if I make one prediction, then that's, that's going to be the one. So that in like five to 10 years at the latest, we're going to have that discussion. Um, and it's, it's not going to be nice. It's going to be really ugly. Mm. Fascinating. But so I Michelle, think just ignoring, um, yeah, sorry, but I, I just think ignoring that question doesn't really, you know, solve the underlying issues. So it's definitely sure. worth discussing it. Yeah, no, great talk. Uh, Michelle, I really enjoyed our talk. Um, uh, where, where can pe people find you uh, uh, besides your, I mean, I've got your, your website. That's uh, mraux.com. I'm going to put that in the show notes. Uh, your Twitter handle? Yeah, I really have to update that one. It's been a long time. Um, so <laughs> thanks for the reminder. Going to try to find some time uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm very active on uh, on Twitter. So handle is also at mraux. Um, so yeah, if you want to send me a message uh, or anything like that, just feel free to reach out. Great.
All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. I hope to maybe have you on a panel discussion in the very near future, <laughs> maybe with some other people, because um, there was also another uh, speaker. What's uh, which I whom I talked to? Um, what's her name? S uh, Santa Mar uh, my Santa Maria, a Department of Finance, Ireland. Oh, so yeah. mm -hmm. my suggestion was, you know, if we could do more of these panel discussions and you know go more into focused uh, subtopics. Uh, in the context of Bitcoin, of course, <laughs> uh, since my podcast is Bitcoin only. So yeah, so thank you so much for your time um, and hope to you know have you back on. Cheers, sounds good. Thank you very All much right. for inviting me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. All right, Michelle. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Cheers.